pronounced word passionately and unrelentingly for first class citizenship. For instance, if the average so called Negro, he doesn't think that he can uh, go into business and provide jobs for himself. We've got to get smart. We've got to organize. And because of this, he thinks that he can only get a job from the white man, or he can only get clothes from the white man, or he can only get food from the white man. We've got to organize so effectively and so well, and engage in such powerful creative protest that there will not be a power in the world that can stop us. We gotta be proud to be black. Don't worry about what they say. We gotta think smarter and live smarter. We gotta want more and work harder. Cause they ain't giving it to us. Put you all in. If you truly wanna make it, can't be waiting for handouts, baby. You gotta take it. Like Martin gotta have a dream, cause he had one. Like Malcolm, by any means, gotta get that done. Don't be ashamed of who you are. Stick your chest out proud. Make them believe that you're the best. Show them what you about. We gotta love each other. Stop killing each other. We gotta unitize and don't believe the lies. This is a message to the blacks and any other minority. Live well and love self. That's the priority. TP been taught for so many centuries that they are nobody is not easy. So they very skillfully uh, made you and me hate our African identity. Maybe the English language should be reconstructed so that teachers will not be forced to teach the Negro child 60 ways to despise himself and thereby perpetuate his false sense of inferiority. Hating our features and our skin and our blood why we had to end up hating ourselves made us feel inferior. We must no longer be ashamed of being black. See, John Boy, everybody. John, do I need to center myself? Look like I'm over too far or something. No, you look okay. That's okay. I mean, just a little bit, change it up a little bit. Yeah, you're fine. You're, I can now zero in if I, you know, when you're making a point and stuff, so I can oh. bring it into you. So, all okay, right. Okay, I'm looking up there at the yeah. monitor and look like I'm way over here to the to the right. That's a, it's, it's, it's a proper position, you know, because you're still the center focus, you know. You just had the banner above you, uh, to the front of you, and uh, to the back of you there. So, you okay. look okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Back to the program. See, Jumbo, everybody. Welcome back to Satora's Black History Corner Internet Program. I am your host, Catherine Hunter-Williams, and my co-host today is out sick, so she will not be with us today. I hope you are getting better, and I'm praying for your health to improve Catherine and total restoration. We'd like to invite you to call in with any questions or comments at 810-208-1854. It should be running across the screen right now. We do, we do like to hear from you. We would like to hear from you, excuse me. Just let us know that somebody is out there watching and you got a question or a comment, just give us a call. We not only tell our story about past great and unsung heroes and sheroes, but also about those living in the present day. On our program, we will always tell our story about the good, the bad, and the ugly. We must tell the truth about the bad and the ugliness of our story in order for you to know the good that has taken place throughout our story. We are still in the month of March, and we are continuing with our celebration of Women's History Month. Um... I'm, I'm going to have to change course a little bit because, as I said, my co-host is not here. So today, I'm going to tell you a story about the youngest and the richest black girl in America who was a multimillionaire in 1914. Did y'all hear me? At the age of 10 years old, she was a multimillionaire at the age, in 1914. She is the richest colored girl in America, and her name is Sarah Rector. 100 years ago, at the age of 10 years old, Sarah Rector, a former slave, became one of the richest little girls in America in 1914. Sarah has been, had been born among the Greek Indians as a descendant of slaves. As a result of an earlier land treaty from the government back in 1887, the government awarded the Creek minor children 160 acres of land which passed to Sarah after her parents' death. Through her allotted land, though her allotted land was thought to be barren and not suitable for agricultural purposes, until oil, y'all hear me now, until oil was discovered in, the, in its depths in 1913, in the famous 
Cushing Oil Field increasing her net income to more than $3 million. She's 10 years old. 10 years old. Her wealth caused immediate alarm, of course, and all efforts was made, were made uh, to put the child Sarah under the guardianship of whites, whose lives became very comfortable immediately. I'm sure it did. Meanwhile, Sarah still lived in humble surroundings. As white businessmen took control of her estate, efforts were also made to put her under the control of officials at Tuskegee Institute. Much attention was given to Sarah in the press. In 1913, there was an eff effort to have her declared white. <laughs> Lord have mercy. So that because of her millions, she could ride in the first class, class cars on the train. They wanted to declare her white so that she could, because she was a multimillionaire, so she could ride in the first class car on the trains. One more time. Um, much attention was given to Sarah in the press. In 1913, there was an effort to have her declared white. Now you look at her picture. It's no way this baby girl could pass for white. Her skin color is looked like, from what I've seen of her pictures, is dark complexion. But they did that, that so that her millions, because of her millions, she could ride in a first class car on the train. So t is this saying that if, if I was a multimillionaire, that I might could be declared white? Give me, call in and give me an answer and tell me what you think about that. The Rector family moved to Kansas City about 1917, where Sarah became somewhat of a local celebrity. She maintained a very lavish lifestyle and attempted entrepreneurship by opening Delray Gardens, a nightclub in the black community of Leeds, located just east of the Vine Street Corridor near 35th and, the Vine and Van Brunt in Kansas City. Sarah's first husband, Kenneth E. Campbell, was involved in many businesses, possibly with the help of his wife, but he is best known for his partnership with Homer B. Roberts, who owned and operated the first black automobile dealership, automobile dealership in the United States. We did do a program on that, I think, John, back last year about uh, Homer B. Roberts. Sarah's second husband, William Crawford, owned a restaurant in the, in the 18th and Vine Street area. Sarah is well known in Kansas City, in the Kansas City black community for the purchase of the Rector Mansion, expensive shopping sprees, and owning several luxury cars. Well, isn't that what you do when you're a multimillionaire? You have a mansion, you own cars, you travel around the world, as many times as you would like to travel. You go shopping. There's endless shopping. And you know us women love to shop. Anyway, I mean, that's what you do as a multimillionaire. She developed good, re good relationship with many of the shop owners and major downtown department stores <laughs> where Jim Crow barriers were relaxed. Sarah was a millionaire during the time when many blacks lived in substandard conditions. In fact, she spent the first 10 years of her life in poverty. When she reached her majority at the age of 21 in 1922, she began handling, began handling her own affairs. Unfortunately, by 1929, the millions were gone. There are some speculations as to what happened to her money. Some believe she spent all of her money maintaining the lavish lifestyle she enjoyed so much, while others speculated that Campbell's bad business, that's her husband, bad business practices played a major role in depleting her funds. Another assumption is that Sarah may have been swindled out of her fortune by guardians and big businesses. The mystery surrounding her money may never be solved. That's our story about... Sarah Richter, Richter, Rector, the richest black girl in America, who in 100 years ago, at the age of 10 years old, 
a former slave, became one of the richest little girls in America in 1914. Sarah Rector. All right. Now, since Catherine is not here, Miss B is not here, I am going to try to read uh, the story, our story about Dr. Valerie Mahomes. Um, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute. I'm trying to see. There is a book out by author Tanya Bolding. If you want to see some more information or research some more information about Sarah Rector, the name of the book is called Searching for Sarah Rector, the Richest Black Girl in America. And uh, the author places the story in a proper historical context, providing Indian Territory and Creek Nation history as the landscape of, of which it occurred. Thus, the name of that book is called Searching for Sarah Rector, the Richest Black Girl in America. And if you looked at, when you see the book and you get the, the cover and you look at her, she does not look like she's the richest little girl in America. <laughs> richest black girl in America. But it's, it's Sarah Rector, and it's a great story. It's a Creek Freeman story. And then it unfolds in this new book, Searching for Sarah Rector, the Richest Black Girl in America. All right. Okay, let's move a little further. Uh, and you please excuse me because, like I said, I'm doing this for Miss B, and she's not here. And the work that I have that she was supposed to uh, be telling the, the story about Dr. Valerie Mahomes is a little different probably than what she has. But I'm going to try to do it in the 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 um the fonts are so very small so please excuse me okay dr valerie mahomes uh she her responsibilities is she developed and promote within the brood it within the broad program mission of the nichd specific projects designed to foster and expand research and research training in the areas of pediatric trauma, including maltreatment and injury, and critical illness in collaboration with colleagues at the NICHD, NIH, and NICs, and other agencies. They initiated and conducted, they initiate and conduct conferences and workshops to assess the states of the science on relevant topics, topics identify gaps in our knowledge and development strategies to those to fill in those gaps. Dr. Valerie Mahomes is currently the acting chief of the Pediatric Trauma and Critical Illness Branch at the Eunice Kennedy Shiver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. That's the NICH. D. Uh, uh, that's the acronyms. That's the name for the acronyms National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. She also manages the child and family processes, child mal maltreatment, and violence research program in the child development and behavior branch at the NICHD. She serves on num numerous federal interagency working groups, including the NIH Child Abuse and Neglect Working Group, she's co-chair, and the Behavioral Health Coordinating Committee, Committee Subcommittee on Trauma and Early Intervention. The Federal Interagency Working Group on Child Maltreatment, the Teen Dating Violence Working Group, and the P- L10995 working group on child on children and adversity. Prior to joining the staff at NICHD, she was a faculty member at the Yale School of Medicine in, in the Child Study Center 
Center School Development Program, where for nearly 13 years, she provided an army of educational, clinical, and technical support service support services to school in low-income neighborhoods and communities around the country. In 1999, she was named the Irvin B. Harris Assistant Professor of Child Psychiatry. In 2003, Dr. Mahomes was awarded the prestigious Executive Branch Science P Policy Fellowship sponsored by the Society for Research and Child Development and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She currently serves on, on this communication and policy committee. This is an interview that was done. I'm not sure who it was, but um, uh, it was. It's called "Exploring the Power of the Parent-Child Bond." And the question, one of the questions they asked her was, uh, uh, "What got her interested in this field?" And, and it's up here at the top, it says, when Valerie Mahone, Ph.D., was young, she observed the power of a girl's bond to her abusive mother. So it was her mother who got her into this. Her, her mother was abusive toward her. Dr. Mahomes didn't know at that time, but it was her first step to a career focusing on childhood abuse and neglect. Her goals is... Uh, are to make sure that children are healthy and wanted and have the opportunity to live to their potential. So for a child and family process, we want to make sure that children are placed on an optional developmental course and our research is helping to illuminate what has, hap what has to happen to ensure that children have safe passage from early childhood and throughout adulthood. In the pediatric trauma and critical illness branch, we research the kinds of medical treatment and intervention that children must have to make sure that they are able to survive critical illnesses and injuries and have good quality, uh, have good quality of life. It could be from intentional or unintentional injuries and it could be from illness. It could be due. Uh, it could be due to abuse and neglect. We're also including effects of natural disasters in that research portfolio. She started uh, April first in two thousand five at nine a.m. And at the time, she had she held an endowed chair in social policy as an early career faculty member at the Yale Child Study Center. And she was going to come to Washington and to change the world for children and females. I mean, children and families, I'm sorry. She started out wanting to be a broadcast journalist, but while she was on her way to fame and fortune in broadcasting, her first job was as an admission officer of a small college. What I learned was that there, was, that there were youth wanting to come to college from inner city communities and rural communities who were really good students, had good high school grade point averages, but were reading on 8th and ninth grade levels on standardized, standardized tests. Well, that's kind of still going on today, Dr. Mahone. She said later, um, at that time, my theory was that there was something about the psycho chromatic properties, the designs, administration, and interpretation of standardized tests that created three disparities and that led to other kinds of disparities economically and in health and in quality of life. At that time, her theory was that there was something about, I'm sorry, I later did my postdoctoral work at Yale Child Study Center, and they focus very much on how the context of one's life informs and influences behavior and cognition and emotion regulation. 
You can't look at a child's achievement in isolation and say that that child is not doing well in school because they are intellectually in inferior. And of course, for minority children, that was the operating theory. In thinking about the context of children's lives, I thought about policy. I thought that it would be important to understand policy and how all of that worked together. So that led her to, to where she is now. This is a question. You oversee a large research portfolio. What are the most important and interesting findings to come out of your program in the last five years? There are some papers coming out now which show links between early adversity and some health outcome. A study by grantee Dr. Jean Brody at the University of Georgia is really important. It's an intergenerational study looking at the impact of stressors of living in rural poverty. The study looks at what we call allostatic load, the psychological toll that stress takes on the body. That's interesting. They have found that it takes a psychological toll on families to press forward, to be resilient, and to do all of the things that help promote quality of life. It's just, fasc it's a, it's just a fascinating study that can inform how we think about resilience and what the implications are of trying to promote resilience especially for families that are managing so much adversity. What are the policies, implications for families who are living in that kind of poverty? How do they overcome some of those obstacles to break the cycle of poverty? To help the, their children take advantage of resources, do well academically and engage in a career or work environment in a way that they could, can have success and break that cycle of poverty. But at the time, at the same time, while families are resilient, we also need to recognize that it is really difficult and that it does take a toll. People need support throughout their life and I think that's an important finding. And even if they appear to be successful and resilient, they still need support. <clears throat> Next question, how does your life outside of the office inform your work? Well, it's funny because I do in private life what I do in my work life. I'm involved in organizations that are service oriented, oriented and that care for disadvantaged youth and families. I'm involved in educational organizations that help to strengthen cultural identity and purpose and that help support fellowship and spiritual development. You have to put yourself in a position to give back. My mission is light in light in life. Oh, excuse me. My mission in life is to help where I can, children and families that are less fortunate. I really absorb myself in those kind of efforts. The idea of helping and extending yourself to help others is part of my culture and my family's culture. When I was a little girl, my parents took in foster children. So between the time I was 10 and 17, we probably had about seven or eight foster children that came through our house. That was the best education I could ever had because it taught me about the issues of attachment. There was a child who had been abused and we got her from the hospital, but she loved her mother so much Despite that abuse, even I, as a young child, could see that the distress of this little girl wanting to be with her mother and her siblings and not with these strange people who had these welcoming open arms. So there is something so powerful about that relationship between the parent and the child. And that's really what got me started and looking at that. The fact that my parents would extend themselves to do just that, do that just, to do that just, 
I think I internalized that and oh my goodness hello okay somebody was calling in okay I guess not um I internalized that and just really wanted to be sure that children are safe and protected. And I think there's a bit of a underlying the choices that I made in terms of my career. Somebody on the phone, John? Okay. Is Catherine, your sidekick, she's calling in, so hold on. My psychic? Oh, sidekick, Catherine? Sidekick, sidekick, oh. sidekick. No, oh, no, 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 that's a co-host, not sidekick. Hi, Catherine. Hey, sister. Hi. I hope I did it. Huh? I was watching the show. It's a good show. <clears throat> well, I'm hoping I'm giving it. This, this writing is so small. I'm having a hard time speaking it and reading it. But, I, you know, <laughs> what I need to know, though, can you tell me why? Um, what does she do? Okay, now I can see you. I can see you now. Okay, what does she do that uh, that you wanted to do our story on her? Well, okay, and there's a delay, for, um, there's a delay, in, I'm talking to you on the phone and a delay on the computer. Yeah, so yeah, just uh, kind of walk away from your computer if you want to, so that way you don't get the feedback, okay, Catherine? Oh, she getting so the feedback. He turn, said you got to walk away from the Yeah, computer. just stick away from just the computer. Just walk away from just walk away from the computer a bit or just turn down your speakers on your phone, uh, your computer, you otherwise feedback. you'll get that feedback, yeah. Okay, I got it, okay. Okay. I kind of, you know, what I see that she's doing is she works with children and, and, and uh -huh. is dealing with uh, the power of the parent and child bond. And one of these, where one of the, the part of this that I was reading is about the best education she could ever have had because she was taught the attach about the issues of attachment and that there was a child who had been abused and her family got her from uh -huh. the hospital. But she loved her mother so much, despite the abuse. You know, when I was growing up, I seen that happen too. I seen mothers that wouldn't feed their children, that did so many devastating things to their children. But the children loved them just so much. And then I would see parents that were good to their children, and then those children would abuse their parents. Well, hate their parents. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's crazy, ain't it? That yeah, really crazy. But yet, yeah, this is a study that she's doing, and it this also has a lot to do with the violent behavior. Of, oh, I'm getting the feedback in the phone now. Is it, John, can you hear me? She says she's getting the feedback in the phone. Yeah, I can't hear her that. But she's coming across here, okay? So I can't he hear the phone. He say he can he can hear you pretty good there. Here. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, I wanted to. Uh, we were talking about uh, the violence with the youth nowadays and uh, with the love between the parents, uh, mothers, and fathers. Uh, there's a study going on now about uh, black men and their relationship with their children. And uh, she's doing a study on the relationship between the children and the mothers. And oh, I thought okay. that was very interesting. Uh, because there's such a violent behavior among our youth nowadays. And it's like you said, uh, especially with history now, if you don't know your history, you were liable to repeat it again. Right. And um, this this is, uh, hold on a minute. I call it somebody has to break the cycle. You know, within abusive families, Someone has to stand up and break that cycle. Otherwise, it continues through generation after generation. Hello? I think I lost her, John. No, I'm sorry. I had to call her. Oh, okay. She's here. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah, I see in her topics, her portfolio is bullying, pediatric injury, and traumatic mm -hmm. uh, brain injury. But the biggest thing that she really do is 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 uh, develop and promote within the broad program mission. 
of specific projects designed to foster and expand research and research training in the areas of pediatric trauma, including maltreatment and injury and critical illness. And also, there's an, another part of her story that, you know, where she grew up in this type of uh, life because her parents would take in foster children who had been abused. And she seen for herself firsthand of um, these children just loving their parents no matter what, despite all the abuse they went through. <coughs> But was she awarded something in recently, or because yeah, she was, she was, she was awarded. Uh, I can't remember. It was on the paper that I had. She just got uh, awarded uh, some prestigious award. Cause I see, uh, in two thousand three, she was awarded I'm, a prestigious executive branch science policy fellowship. Sp yeah, that's a big thing. Yeah, that's, that's a in two hundred three. A black woman. That's a big thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to have to get off the phone before I get sick again. All right. Well, I just Thanks for to calling in. That I'll be doing a good, great show, great show. Thank you. I, I really hope like I was that. sounding Thank clear because, you. you know, this, this writing on here is extremely small. So next time I'll make sure I make it larger. But I didn't know I was going to okay. have to be reading it. But that's okay. We got All it. All right. We did I our like story. That. So you just take care well. of you and you get well. Oh, yeah, I got to do I got, got a lot. I'm, yeah, I think you're breaking up, go. though. Okay. Okay. All right, I'll talk to you. Get yes, better. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. That was my co-host, Catherine uh, Blake, calling in. And I'm glad she did so she could help me understand a little bit more because this is who she was going to... Um, tell our story about Dr. Valerie Mahomes. And I told the story, our story about Sarah Rector, the richest black girl uh, in America. So that's our stories for today. And we hope that you're still celebrating uh, March, uh, Black Women's History Month, and that you're taking your children to some event, or that you're sitting down with them and reading them ab about a hero, or sh uh, or uh, I mean a shero, or or even an unsung person that nobody really knows about, but has done some great things. So get out and celebrate, celebrate at home, light a candle, and sit down with your children and pass this history on. You got to pass our story on. If you don't, it will cease to exist. All right. Satora's Black History Corner Internet Program comes to you via satellite at www.ustream.tv channel Flint Talk Radio. That's one word. That's www.ustream, U-S-T-R-E-A-M dot TV dot channel and Flint Talk Radio, one word. You can watch our program every second and fourth Monday of the month starting at 3.30 p.m. Also, be sure to watch what's going on with political pundit Dr. George Moss every Monday at 2 p.m. Well, we hope you enjoyed the song you heard at the beginning of our program, Be Proud to Be Black. We hope you enjoyed our story today of uh, about Sarah Rector and Dr. Um, Valerie Mahomes. And um, if you would, and I'm sorry, I got off track here. Forgive me. Uh, if you like the song you heard at the beginning of our program, Be Proud to Be Black, featuring Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, and you would like to, to support this young man and get more information about his CD single, you can contact TP at 810-962-3258. That's 810-962-3258. We must begin to support our own. As always, I like to say Asante, which means in Swahili, thanks to all of you who have watched our program today. And if you have liked what you have seen and heard, please pass it on to others. Until next time, keep on keeping on with us, along with the sounds of Be Proud to Be Black and with the celebration of our story all year long. My Heavenly Father bless you, keep you safe and in his perfect hotel, which means 
Peace. Be ashamed of being black. 